YouTube, welcome to my channel, Anna Bella, and today I am at Swannington Incline, ta da, um, mining, and I am going to be doing my Rings of Power Season 2 review. Season 2 of Rings of Power has had mostly positive reviews because it follows the prequel to The Lord of the Rings, The Similarian, more closely, and I apologise if I've said that wrong, but at this point I don't care. Um, obviously, you've got Sauron or Sauron, Sauron, however you say his name, Anatar, um, form, storyline, with Celebrimbor, a more pompous name you could never find among the elves, bless him. Celebrimbor um, was an elf lord, had his own city, ruled it, governed it, but his speciality was the best elven smiths, um, just like um, Celeborn, that's Galadriel's husband, who you might say, because he's not actually in the Rings of Power yet, um, is really into trees, growing them. Celebrimbor is really into smithing. It is his hobby. And when elves are really into something, they do it to perfection. Um, so there's a lot of bittersweet comments. Personally, I love season two. I am at some point going to rewatch season one because I think going back and rewatching season one, I'm actually going to understand it a bit more. And that's how they've designed this. This is a thinking person show. First thing, the orcs. J.R. Tolkien was always conflicted about the orcs. He never was happy to just have them as slaves. I'm loving the fact that Adar, the, you know, the who is an elf from the first age who got corrupted by Morgoth, not Sauron, or Sauron, however, moving swiftly on, um, got corrupted and he really wanted children. And I'm loving the fact that throughout all of this, he has been honorable, even though he is a corrupt elf, he's done the best for his children and weirdly enough having the pacifist orc with that orc family kind of highlights that these are twisted corrupt elves that want peace that want the same things that everybody else does just in a twisted corrupted version of it and i think that's really important that we actually look at that because J.R. tolkien was never happy with them just being slaves he was very conflicted about them himself special effects were great Welding, I'm loving that there's a welding of races, of peoples, of languages all the way through this, how friendship welds people together, very much like Mithril welds people, Mithril and Sauron's blood welds together, I love that. Um, I'm loving the dwarfs and Durin, I really, really love, spoiler warning, I really loved the scene of Durin's dad jumping, that is one of the best images we have, jumping towards the Balrog, towards certain death, but it's so iconic now so in my mind that is the most bravest courageous thing to do he realizes his mistake and he tries to correct it even though he knows he's gonna die perfection absolutely love them there's nothing wrong with the dwarves the dwarves are great and in fact the dwarves have a very valid point which is the elves are immortal because they're immortal they think they're above everybody they think they behave like gods I love during speech in season one when he says you missed my wedding you missed the birth of my kids where have you been like, I know you're immortal, but I'm not. And it's interesting that Durin himself understands his dad's perspective, where he says the elves' quest for living forever is their inability to accept death. Because dwarves accept death, we're actually in a better place. Even though they get corrupted by their dwarf rings and greed comes to them, they accept their end. Even though they do go out and try and recolonize bits, but when they die, you know, they accept it. I'm loving the opening titles of season one and season two, which follows J.R. Tolkien's creation myth for the whole of Middle Earth. Love that. Absolutely love that. Yes, this is a bittersweet season. I've waited to do this review for a lot of reasons. But the best part of Rings of Power is the fact it's conversational. You have two or three main characters in a scene, and a scene can be 10 minutes, and they're having really good discussion about where they should go, what they should do next how they think this is going to play out. Even Sauron or Anatar or whatever you want to call him at this point is not sure. In fact, in season one, him and Galadriel had to do what they did because they were stuck in the limbo sea. They couldn't get out of it. They were like, what are we going to do? Just bob around this sea forever and never get to Middle Earth and never die. Shall we do that, dear? Shall we? Oh, we could do. That's not useful or productive. Oh, we've got to go to Numenor. Oh, Numenor, we can get a ship back. You know, their paths. It was cosmic. Galadriel is right that something was guiding them. And in fact, that particular part, 
season one is when the whole of Middle Earth was in kind of this weird balance. Morgoth was gone, Sauron wasn't Sauron, he was something else. He'd just been overthrown by Adar, who was like, no, you're not having my orcs as slaves, we're going to go on our own path. My orcs deserve a home, they deserve to be respected as a race of their own, like the dwarves, like the men, like the elves, you know? We're Uruks, yeah? I love that. Celebrimbor. Oh, Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor is very much, the Anatar um, storyline is very much being blinded by an angel of light, like Lucifer coming down, giving this knowledge. I'm Anatar, the giver of gifts. I'm going to help you build some dwarf rings and save the dwarf kind. And I'm going to give some, then I'm going to make some nine rings and save men. It's going to be great. He's like an angel. He's a devil appearing as an angel. I love that. That is very, very Roman Catholic. Um, allegory and yes I do get the metaphor of the raft and the ruin at the end of this season it's lovely there's a lot of Catholic mythology and metaphors in the Lord of the Rings because J.R. Tolkien was Catholic shocker just like there's a lot of Church of England metaphors in Chronicles of Narnia, Narnia because C.S. Lewis was a member of the Church of England shocker um, absolutely loved it there's eight episodes in season two Celebrimbor Celebrimbor is blinded by his own pride and his own ambition he lies to his own king this shocks Anatar Anatar hadn't done, done anything yet all he done was done his like light show hey I'm the giver of gifts I'm gonna help you with these rings do you think we should make them and Celebrimbor was like just wait I'm gonna write to the king and I'm gonna tell him that I've closed the forge and Anatar's like what all it took was a light show for you to lie to the high king of all elves and say you're going to close the forge you're going to say that we're doing nothing and we're just going to continue on all i had to do was a pretty light show and come down out of the clouds like a god and you've lied and Celebrimble did that off his own back Sauron did nothing he knew not to invite halbrand in and yet he did and then halbrand turned into anatar and then after that, he was like, hold on, I'm just going to write to the king, I'm going to lie. And he lied in that letter. Admittedly, he didn't get the letter telling him that Halbran was Sauron. Or Sauron. Oh, pronunciation. Who cares? But Sauron really didn't have to do a lot to get Celebrimbor to do that. And I love the scene between, there was some really, really great scenes. The scene where Elrond kill, kills, kisses Gladriel. Uh, to give her that pin, I loved that scene because it wasn't romantic and even Anna was like, I'm not quite sure you're dating but you look lovely like your mum. So that shows how old Adar is. And was he rejected? Did no elf want to mate with him? Hence why? Because he had black hair? Who knows? Because even when he was in his elf form, which we do see when he puts on that ring, he's got black hair. So maybe like the elves just don't like people with black or brown hair. Maybe they're racist that way. I don't know against other elves because we haven't actually seen a black-haired elf maybe he was like i really wanted children but no elf female would mate with me maybe that's his deal so you've got the celebrimbor pompous pride thing going on and sauron had to like it's interesting because at the end of season one gladriel gets jealous because halbrand and celebrimbor start being pally 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 and she's like no i'm not liking this we need to dig deeper because he's taking my best friend away and i think that that is a really interesting relationship I loved the scene where Adar and Gladriel had that conversation and she didn't tell him what Sauron offered her. In fact, the only person that Gladriel opens up enough to say what Sauron really offered her, which was basically to be his queen and an equal, she didn't really say it was Frodo. She said, you would have a queen, but she didn't tell him that actually Halbrand had A, offered her to be a partner and his crib and that they were going to rule Middle Earth and govern it together. She left that bit out, rightly so, to be absolutely fair. And if you go back and watch um, Kate Blanchett in The Lord of the Rings, in the Fellowship one, when she sees Aragorn and she strokes his face, I'm like, oh, I know why you're doing that. Oh, this is all, like, because she's now giving the gifts to destroy Sauron. See? Yeah, yeah, she's now the giver of gifts. So it's really interesting. And J.R. Tolkien said of both Sauron and Gladriel that they were equals of each other um, and that's interesting he also said that Gladwell was never deceived by him and in fact she wasn't she was blinded and it's interesting Celebrimbor also was blinded and it's I loved Celebrimbor's speech where he said to him 
you even deceive yourself now because Sauron does he doesn't know what he's doing and Gladriel said to him that he this was his design from the beginning this what he, was what he wanted he never really was into us and he then turns around and says oh yeah you do think too much of me and it was just so crushing because he was like, you could see that he didn't really want to say that, but he did. We are going to get to Tom Bombadil and the Dark Wizard, please. I have not forgotten them. The door is open. The door is shut. Oh, it was so bittersweet. They are going to meet again. I definitely see that. I love the ending with the sword holding up and everybody looking hopeful because, yeah, we're on Lord of the Rings now. It's going to take like maybe two seasons and then we're done with Rings of Power. I'm loving the fact that it took one season to get the three elf rings, second season dwarf rings and men rings made. We've got to give those rings to the men. We've got to see who he chooses. I am going to talk about Tom Bombadil. I love the folk song. There's two versions. There's the American version and there's the British version. Tom Bombadil, brilliant character, finally brought to life. A lot of people in the UK read Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil as either a god character or gay coded. Um, yes, he is also married um, to the River Daughter, um, and I'm loving the fact that there are two things. One, he has a goat. Two, he has a lamb by the fire. Three, he has that hedgehog teapot that all the women want. And two, he says to Gandalf, who is not Gandalf, who's a stranger at this point, says, my job is to gather the lilies. Lilies are another form of basically the dead so his job is not to intervene it's to support the falling stars as they come down to teach them their purpose and to gather the dead because remember this is only the second age of middle earth we're not even in the third age yet and it's really fascinating i'm loving the fact we've got the creation story at the start with the titles then we're in second age i really would like to actually have a scene with morgoth or even a little flashback of what his goals were, what was his objective, because he's another one, he's another Gellert Grindelwald, who we're neither sure, was he really for wizard freedom, or was he going to kill everybody? It's fascinating in itself, I really think, um, that it just, you need, you want more. Tom Bombadil, brilliantly brought to screen, big tick there, five out of five for me. Overall, I really love season two, and I know a lot of people did because it fulfills more of the law. I know some people are like, you can't do that. What is Elrond doing? He can't kiss his mother-in-law. And I'm like, look, it's a show. They're showing an interpretation of how things might have gone down. I loved Adar. I thought that his death, I knew, I knew that his children were going to eventually kill him because they're twisted elves. They don't know. They don't know that Adar was protecting them. I really want to know what Sauron promised the orcs to get them to join him because all Adar was doing was he was protecting his children and Gladriel, and Gladriel got that. She was like, yes, we're going to have a peace and it was snatched away from them. And you really feel that going through that one of the reasons why Gladriel has to diminish eventually after she does her screaming X and flashing at Sauron, even though they don't kill each other when they do meet, is the fact that she could see how things might have changed, had things gone a little bit differently, had Sauron and her kept that balance up. Yeah, it's fascinating. There's so many possibilities in the second age. It's, you can taste the, op the options. I really want to know what Saruman, who's now the Dark Wizard, I hate that they've called him the Dark Wizard, what's he going to do to make him be a light wizard? Because he's just trashed the Shire again. <laughs> All he does is harrow, harrow. Harris, the blinking hobbits. It's interesting because I associate orcs and the harrowing of the Shire very much with mining and coal and the Industrial Revolution and the wrecking of agricultural Britain. And J.R. Tolkien would have memories of that. It's very interesting how that gets put into the books. They are very, very British books if you read them from a British perspective. I know other countries, the USA is mad on it. Um, but if you read them from an English and British perspective, 
very much like Harry Potter. A lot of what the, co- the Wizarding World culture in that is actually British culture. You just don't know that you're reading that. And it's the same in Lord of the Rings with everybody having a title and a place and a hierarchy within their own social class group slash race. Even within that, it's very rigid. And I find it fascinating. One of the best things about it is when Gladriel and Sauron are together on their raft, they really form that balance and that is really interesting to explore and I'm really hoping that we're going to explore it again in season three because I get the feeling that he's going to turn up again and she's going to have to keep rejecting him keep rejecting him because she's never going to let him in like she did in the first season the first season was pure beauty for their relationship because they relied on each other without that they wouldn't have built the middle earth that they've got so it's whose fault is it and Gladriel says to herself heal yourself because you're part of the problem but is he really had the elves not had those three rings they would have faded far sooner which means that Sauron would have lived longer would he though there's so many tantalizing shoulda coulda woulda possibilities so many different options based on a choice and I think that's one of the reasons why Tom Bombadil is doing what he's doing he's like No, your job, Gandalf, is to wander about, gather the information, and defeat the Dark Wizard and and defeat Sauron. My job is to gather the lilies and maintain nature. Maintain spring, summer, winter, autumn. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. Maintain that cycle so that things can still grow even though all of this evilness is going on. I'm loving the fact that we had that... um, the dwarves are gonna come, the dwarves are gonna come. They didn't come, and then they came, and you're like, yay! And it's like, oh! Yeah, and having the Balrog, and ha- seeing seeing these things. I know some people are like, oh, we're seeing everything now. We shouldn't be seeing everything. We shouldn't see, this is, I'm like, it's not set in stone, people. This is just an interpretation of the Sumerian. It could have gone a different way. I'm really liking what they're doing with it. They're playing with it. They're exploring these characters, but they're doing it in a way that is really respectful. The visuals are stunning. Special effects are stunning. The horse stunts are stunning. The costumes are great. I don't get why people are hating on it because the Sumerian as a book is really dull and boring to read. It reads like a history textbook because that's what it is. This is telling the possible story of how the Nine Rings came to be. Yes, we know the Anatar stuff because that is in the Similarian. We've seen it. I love the fact how they use Celebrimbor as that banner at the end. Yes, it wasn't like it is in the books, but I really thought that his final speech was, you are trapped by these rings. You're the Lord of the Rings now. Anyway, I've babbled enough. Five out of five for me, season two. Absolutely loved it. Please like, comment and subscribe. And don't forget to click the notification bell for my latest video. Thank you so much for the support. I'm hoping that you're staying safe wherever you are. I really would like them to do Rings of Power season three. I think it's good enough. We've got more mileage to go, possibly another two seasons and then stop. Why not?